welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased to have you joining us again today. What a wonderful time we will have today in God's Word. Uh, we are going to serve communion today. Pastor Grant will be offering communion. So quickly run and grab yourself some juice and a cracker or whatever you have available so that you can join in and celebrate communion with us. At this moment, I would just like to read today's scripture, which is from the book of Revelation, and I'm going to read chapter 9 to the end. So it says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. It was saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum and to Theatria and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. And his head and his hair were white, like the white wool, like snow and his eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, and when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And this is God's word. May it be blessed to your heart. And now Pastor Grant will join us and bring us today's message. Good morning and welcome. It's good to uh, be with everyone on a wonderful day like today. July 3rd. Happy Canada Day and to everyone that's joining us. I hope you enjoyed the wonderful weekend and holiday and celebration of our, our nation and uh, all that it means because we have uh, much to celebrate in the freedoms and the wonderful things that God has given us here in this land. Well, it's communion as well. And today we're going to take some thoughts from Isaiah 53 and we're going to have communion. And so I hope you get a piece of bread or a wafer and uh, some juice and uh, we will shortly have communion. Isaiah 53, what a wonderful text. Really, it talks about the suffering servant who is none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Isn't it nice to know that we have a Savior, that we have a Redeemer, and we have the Wonderful One, who is none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord 
the Alpha and Omega of all things. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he instituted the Lord's Supper. This was something that he did with his disciples on that evening. And um, it's a reflection of something that we can do and participate in. And we have as Christians for many, many centuries now, honoring and remembering our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take eat this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And so this night is a very special night. It's a night that Jesus is inaugurating and instituting the Lord's Supper. But I noticed the word given for you. His body was given for you and for me, for them as well. As he hung on Calvary's cross, he took the pain. He was stricken like nobody has ever been stricken. He was whipped and he was flogged that we might have life and have it so wonderful in eternity with him. So as the bread of life, Jesus called himself that, that he was the bread of life. Friends, take your bread, take and eat. We give you thanks, O Lord God, for the goodness and mercy of Jesus. We thank you for the fact that he is the only begotten son, the son of the most high. And yet he was the bread of life given for us. We give you praise today and thank you for all he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And on the same night, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which will be shed for you. The shedding of blood was something. There seems to be a wonderful truth in the scriptures about the life is in the blood and and even scientists, even now, it's, it's an amazing study to look at the blood and to find all the life and the wonderful way in which it, it flows through our bodies and keeps us going. But Jesus' blood was shed for us. Friends, take and drink. We give you praise, Lord Jesus, that you died on Calvary's cross. And you said... Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We thank you that we have a forgiving Savior, a loving Savior, a Savior and a Redeemer who loves us with an infinite love. We can only stand in awe and survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And all our things that we have done, we throw them down at your feet and thank you for the goodness and mercy which is in you, Lord Jesus, with the amazing grace, with the amazing grace that you give. We give you praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And I hope and pray as the week unfolds, you'll have a wonderful week and a glorious week to celebrate in the goodness and grace of our Lord Jesus. Now, you might want to get a pen and some paper because this is a magnum opus of a sermon. And I only say that word because it's a Christological sermon. It points to Jesus. It honors Jesus. It is all full about Jesus. It is a wonderful statement about who he is and was and what he made claims about himself. This is also a triumphant sermon, an encouraging sermon, and a sermon that will uplift any drooping heart. I am so positive of this because of all the wonderful way in which God has led me to put this message together. The title of our message today is called The Lamb Wins, and it will be taken from the text of Revelation chapter seven, nine 
to 17. But here is some other verses that are there to remind us of the goodness and grace of Jesus and the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they did not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And in Revelation 5, 13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and as such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Oh, what a Savior we have, my friends. What a Savior. So, Revelation 7, 9 to 17. Let me read our text for you today. And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise, and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor, and power, and strength, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord is amazing. Well, welcome. Good morning. I've used this little uh, illustration before but it serves a very great purpose in this message today. So I'm going to refresh your minds with it now. On November 27th, 1989, the day when communism fell in Czechoslovakia, a Methodist church in the capital city of Prague erected a sign. For decades, the church had been forbidden any publicity, but with the winds of freedom blowing, the Christians posted three words, which summarized not only the New Testament in general, but the whole book of Revelation. The Lamb wins. Yes, those were the three words. Their point was not that Christ had unexpectedly gained the victory, but that they had been reigning, he had been reigning in triumph all along. Many throughout history, actually, have also used the Latin term Christus Victor, which means Christ the Victor, which means the Lamb wins. Friends, Christians can't lose. Jesus is believed to have died at the age of 33 after a life of approximately 12,000 days. The gospel writers devoted most of their work to just 1,100 of those days, the last three years of his life. And their primary interest was in one particular day, the day he was crucified. Did you know that this 24-hour period changed the world? And each of the four Gospels talks about it. These 24 hours of Jesus' life changed the world, and I believe that the, this truth can also change your life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ can change everyone. With Christ Jesus, there is a new day. He is, in fact, the Son of God. He is the King of glory, the Savior of the world, and the Lamb of God. Jesus, our Emmanuel, is Jesus with all power. Because Jesus, the Christ, is God in person. God with us. 
In Jesus, God entered a world where evil seems to have the upper hand. He took the worst blows of the enemy, being, being subject to the powers that conspired to destroy him. He was beaten, abused, mocked, and crucified. And just when things seemed lost, yes, Jesus arose. Amen. And in his resurrection, he dealt a finishing blow to the forces of evil, sin, and even death. Christ became the victor. Yes, church. Yes, Christ became the victor. With his victory, all humankind was offered the opportunity to join forces with him, to be set free from the power of evil, sin, and death, and to live lives of hope. And be that planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 61, 3. First, our hope. Christus victor. Do you know what the best news in all the world is? It's this. The victory is already guaranteed. Christ has conquered the causes to which the devil has devoted himself, which are sin and death and his own selfless death and glorious resurrection, and being raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, as it says by St. Paul in Romans 6. The fear of death made us slaves, but the promise of life has made us free. As Colossians 2.15 would say, Christ has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. The devil is losing a, lo uh, a losing battle. He knows his time is short and filled with flurry, fury and ferocity. And out of sheer bitterness, he's trying to drag as many people down as he can while he can. Christ Jesus is our victor and has won the victory. Christ Jesus is the champion of our salvation and is the lamb who wins. Second, Jesus came as a conqueror. Not like the conquerors history delights in. Not like King Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus the Great or Alexander the Great or Attila the Hun or Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte. In Old Testament times, the great empires like the Hittites, the Assyrians and the Babylonians would send a special envoy a messenger sent with terms of peace to the opposing party. They came with what was called a covenant treaty. It was terms of peace, but the terms were dictated by the Caesarian overlord, like be at peace with us, pay the tribute, send delegates to our court, and we will protect you from the Egyptians or whatever competing power is at your door. The Bible says in Acts 10 that Jesus came with a message of peace like that. He was the heavenly messenger of peace. The book of Romans says God was in Christ to reconcile the world to himself. And in Zechariah 9 verses 9 and 10, the prophet declares, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. Lowly and riding on a donkey, on a foal, the coal, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to wonderful sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. And that is found in Zechariah 9. In a world ridden with war and fear and despair, God is bigger. And greater. The prophet Micah declared, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Many have surrendered to his kingdom and entered into a covenant with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and have surrendered to his lordship. So we are more than conquerors, victorious through Christ who loves us, with the law of liberty burning in our hearts. As we wear the spiritual armor of God, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Captives are set free. The year of the Lord is proclaimed. The great exchange of beauty for ashes is given. And the garment of praise for a spirit of despair is put in place, that he may be glorified. Our Lord is a conqueror, and he leads us with jubilance. Make no mistake, 
Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Why? Because he is a conquering Christ. Second, he is amazing and triumphant. The Bible says that he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for also for the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2. In his sermon from Re uh, Revelation 5.6, the great Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren in 1891 said these words, This is the aspect of Christ with which we must begin, if we would know him in the full greatness of his gifts and sweep of his work. Unless we do see Jesus Christ as the vanquishing conqueror who triumphs over his enemies, we shall have but an unworthy conception of his wondrous love and an inadequate estimation of his all-healing power. The evidence of his rule and authority is plain to those who are not blinded by pride. The fact of his rule should be the unalterable conviction of every Christian soul. Jesus made these marvelous claims about himself. Behold, before Abraham was, I am. I and my father are one. He that has sent me has seen the father. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Surely I come quickly. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. John 6, 47. Christ is worthy of our heart's devotion. And here are some worthy things to think about. Never before and not since has any man been able to defy scientific limits and turn water into wine, but Jesus did. In a phenomenal mathematical equation, he multiplied two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, and had 12 baskets of leftovers. But Jesus did. With amazing power over all of nature, metaphysical limits were altered as he walked on water. But Jesus did. He raised Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the clutches of death simply by saying to her, Arise! And immediately she rose. Yes, Jesus did. He displayed power over the flesh and defied medical science, healed the sick, and a lady with an issue of blood was healed. When, he simply, when she simply touched the hem of his garment. He raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. Yes, Jesus did. He is the one who calls into existence things that did not exist. He is also the one who gives life to the dead. Romans 4.17 says that. He is the only begotten word, the ever eternal son, begotten of the father without beginning or end. The absolutely perfect son. The true image of the Heavenly Father, equal in glory and honor, says Athanasius. He goes on by saying, Jesus is very God of very God. As the Apostle John says in his general epistles, and we are in him that is true, even the Son who is Jesus Christ. This is the true God and everlasting life. Almighty of almighty, for all things which the Father rules and sways, the Son rules and sways as well. He had descended from the bosom of the Father, took from the Virgin Mary our humanity, Christ Jesus whom he delivered of his own will to suffer for us. As the Lord said, no man takes my life. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. In which humanity he was crucified and died for us and rose from the dead and was taken into the heavens. When on earth he showed us light from darkness, salvation from error, life from the dead, an entrance to paradise and said even to the thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise he showed us also the way to heaven and he will judge the quick and the dead christ's victory also empowers those born of god to overcome the world through faith in jesus christ as the son of god christ has overcome the world and therefore his people are at peace in revelation john looks to the victory of the lamb who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who has defeated the beast and his adherents, and the Lord brings his chosen and faithful ones with him in this victory in Revelation 17. John calls the faithful those who overcome. They have overcome their accuser, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony of Revelation 12. And they have the promise of blessings of all kinds. 
Martin Luther said in the 1500s, there were no resources, no help, no comfort for us until this only and eternal Son of God in his unfathomable goodness had mercy on us because of our misery and distress and came from heaven to help us. Those tyrants and jailers, he said, have now been routed and their place has been taken by Jesus Christ, the Lord of life and righteousness and every good thing and every blessing. He has snatched us poor creatures from the jaws of hell and made us free and restored us to the Father's favor and grace. You know, he's the initiator of the Lord's Supper. He's the Prince of Shalom and wondrous peace. He's the marvel of the age and he's the forever steadfast. He supplies strength for the weak and the powerless, and he's available for the weakened and the spent. He saves and salvages. He forgives sinners, and he forgives, and he frees captives. He's the living Logos and the eternal word. Brethren, he's the mighty captain of our salvation, and he's the commander of conquerors, and he's the head of heroes and prince of princes. He's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha and Omega of everything there is, of everything that can be, should be, will be, or can be. He's the Blessed and Only Sovereign, 1 Timothy 6 we'll talk about. And he's the day spring from on high. Zechariah in the first chapter of Luke will mention that. His reign is righteous and his yoke is painless. He's so amazing and triumphant that the heaven of heavens cannot encompass him, let alone encase him. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father and prince of peace. And of the increase of his government, there will be no end. He's the sinner's savior, the anointed one, and a hiding place for the helpless. He, Jesus, the son of the most high, is amazing. The entire realm of heaven is enthralled with, his, with this one who is worthy of all worship. So what did he conquer? Jesus Christ vanquished the powers hostile to God. Jesus has authority over all creation. The wind, the waves, the angelic realm obey him totally. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3 Jesus has authority over everything. And in Philippians chapter 2, it says at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow because Jesus is Lord of all. And Jesus has authority over all the forces of hell as well. No force of hell can prevail. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. There is nothing Satan or all the demons can do to you. Nothing can come to the life of Christ's followers that hasn't already been filtered through his loving and very capable hands. And even David in the Psalms said, I will fear no evil. James said, even the demons believe and shudder at the mention of his name. Fourthly, he is amazing and he's victorious. This changing world can be a scary place for people who trust in themselves. But those who trust in Christ can rejoice. His power is absolute and his promises are certain. His office is manifold and his love never changes. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's proven and pure. He's imperially powerful and he's impartially merciful. Brethren, he's the focal point of all civilization and the entire joy of all of heaven. Brethren, he's the, the wonderful Christmas child and the heir of heaven. He's exceptional. He's unqualified. He... Unequal, I mean. He's unprecedented and preeminent. Brethren, he's the defender of the weak. He's a protector and a supporter. He's the firstborn over all creation. In other words, he's the protocos of all things. Colossians 1.15. He's the fairest of 10,000, the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. He's the wellspring of wisdom and he's the doorway of deliverance. Jesus is good news. He's the greatest door to ever enter. He's the pathway of peace. He's the avenue of righteousness. He's the boulevard of awesome holiness. And he's the gateway of glory and majesty that's absolutely unparalleled. He himself said, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the true vine. And he's the way and the truth and the life for us right now, today. His life is matchless and his goodness is limitless. 
and he's the resurrection and the life. With total greatness, he completes all his assignments and finishes his course and offers rest to all who will accept him. Praise his glorious name. In his Galatians lectures in 1531, Martin Luther repeated a theme that he had used for over a decade, that of the magnificent duel between Christ and Satan, in which Christ resisted Satan's power and won a victory over the law, sin, our flesh, and the world, the devil, death, hell, and all evils. And this victory of his, he has given to us. Even though these tyrants, our enemies, accuse us and terrify us, they cannot drive us into despair or condemn us. For Christ, whom God the Father raised from the dead, is victor over them, and he is our righteousness. In other words, everything that once used to torment and oppress us, Christ has set, us, set aside. He has disarmed it and made a public example over it, triumph, triumphing over it. Luther continued, you know, to proclaim Christ as the conqueror of all the believer's enemies throughout the entire rest of his life. Jesus' story is a life-transforming story. I hope it's your story today. A triumphant church bought by the precious blood of Christ Jesus will reign eternally and forever with him throughout all eternity. His word is abundant and is inspired. He's unmatchable and he's unbeatable. Brethren, the lamb wins. In conclusion, the resurrection of Jesus, the, the resurrection is Jesus' battle cry of victory, and it's supposed to be ours too. A victory over evil, a victory over the accuser, a victory over everything that's so wrong in this world. And so in light of this, Jesus says to you and I, come with me if you want to live. Have you done this? Have you done this? I hope you have. He gives us eternal life, something millions of people have searched after. The world over, searching in vain, but Christ is the light of life. The gospel is this, Jesus died for your sins and mine, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead and offers you and I life eternal. Jesus is alive right now. He's seated right next to God the Father. He's God the Son, seated in glory, victorious, watching over his church, growing across this earth. And he loves you and me. And if you will turn to him, then he will set you free from all your sins and give you a new life. Call out to him. That's what I did. And because of faith, I've been reconciled to him by faith. For Christians, the lamb is a sign of victory and hope of glory. With Christ, we lack nothing. And goodness and mercy will follow us all the rest of our lived long days. So who wants to join the winner? Do you know that with Christ, you will avoid Armageddon and you won't weep for Babylon? Brethren, he's the God of the garden and the Lord of eternity. Neil T. Anderson said this, a Christian is not simply a person who is forgiven and goes to heaven. A Christian in terms of his or her deepest identity is a saint a spiritually born child of God, a divine masterpiece, a child of light, a citizen of heaven. The song in Christ alone says, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. You can't live without him, and you, you can't outlive him, and you can't live without him, friends. You probably do not remember the name that I'm going to mention. The name is Nikolai Ivanovich Berkerin, nor should you. But during his day, he was as powerful a man as there was on earth. A Russian communist leader, he took part in the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. He was the editor of the Soviet newspaper Prada, which means truth, and was a full member of the Politburo. His works on economics and political science, you know, are still read even to this day. There is a story told about a journey he took from Moscow to Kiev in 1930 to address a huge assembly on the subject of atheism. Addressing the crowd, he aimed his heavy artillery at Christianity, hurling insult after insult, argument and proof against it. An hour later, he was finished, and he took out what seemed to be, he looked out at the smoldering ashes of men's faith. Are there any questions? 
he blurted. Deafening silence filled the auditorium, and then one man slowly arose and approached the platform and mounted the lectern standing next to this leader. He surveyed the crowd, first to the left and then to the right. Finally, he shouted the wonderful truth that was well known in the Russian church at the time. Christ is risen! And in mass, the whole crowd arose as one man, and the response came crashing like the sound of thunder. He is risen indeed. Why does Christus Victor matter to us today? Because Christ's victory stands in the middle of defeat. No matter what happens to you and I, if you and I remain in Christ, you will win no matter what. Christ's victory in the middle of defeat gives us hope for tomorrow. Christ's victory allows us to overcome temptation. In his victory, we truly have hope. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and the victory he's won for you is available right now. Christ is amazing. Praise the Lamb. The Lamb wins. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful day. May these truths penetrate our hearts, Lord. You are the victor. You are the amazing one. You're heaven's darling. You're amazing in every way, Lord Jesus. We just pray that the whole church, whether it's in Pefala or Ontario or Canada or the world, would be revived with these truths today. That the Lamb, the Son of God, is amazing in every way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord willing. We'll see you next week. God bless you.